This is the Paracay Podcast, proudly brought to you by major sponsor Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club, Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty, Bo Cook from Loan Market, BTZD, the official apparel partner of the Paracay Podcast, and the Parramatta Times, the official media partner of the Paracay Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Paracave Podcast. And now over to your host, Troy Warner, broadcasting live from the world famous Paracave. And yes, hello and welcome back to another cracking episode of the Paracave Podcast. Troy Warner here, and this is the interview style podcast which comes out once a week on a Thursday. And we are going back to the fans and members series of Rugby League. And it just so happens that today's guest is a Parramatta Eels fan, so that's always great to talk about. Now, he's also a bit of a celebrity as well, and that person is Mr. Paul Gow. Now, Paul is a Australian professional golfer. He has toured on the U.S. Tour and the Australian Tour in the past, but now heads up the How Good Is Golf uh, TV show on Fox Sports, so you can check that one out, which is on a Tuesday night at 8.30, I think it is, and followed by playing around with, uh, as also one of his shows as well, which is on straight after How Good Is Golf, so check that one out, it's a great show, uh, Check he catches up with some celebrities, and they have a round of golf and a few little challenges here and there. In, in the show so it's a good watch and a very interesting one as well you get to see a different side of celebrities and sports stars uh, playing golf so uh, during this chat we actually talk about some of the uh, shows that he has done and who he's had on the show who was coming up we also talk about growing up in the Parramatta area how he ended up supporting the Parramatta Eels uh, overseas support for the Eels what he saw overseas as he spent a lot of time in the US uh, what great Parama- Parramatta memorabilia he has uh, obviously how many hole-in-ones does Paul Gow have now that will blow you away um, and also, we talk about golf as well, obviously, and he talks about playing golf with Jack Gibson, Clint Gutherson, Mitch Moses, Fatty Vorton, Peter Sterling, and a bunch of others as well, as well as the quick top 10 and the personality set of six. So that's what we cover through in this episode, and it is all brought to you by the great people, major sponsor, Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club, Bo Cook from Loan Market, Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty, BTZD Teamwear, the official apparel sponsor of the Paracave Podcast, and the Parramatta Times, the official media partner of the Paracave Podcast. More details about the sponsors and the merchandise, which you can purchase now after the chat with Gowie. But I'm sure you'll love that one. Uh, and as Hindy says... Get a beer, coffee, whatever you want. Sit back, relax and enjoy. And let's get straight into it. Hey, I'm Paul Gow, Washed Up Tour Pro, uh, now the host of How Good Is Golf on Fox Sports. I'm going to hang out with Troy from the Para Cave Podcast. Listen in. And as you heard from his intro, my guest today on the Para Cave Podcast, well, he's known as a professional golfer, former professional golfer. He's also the host of How Good Is Golf on Fox Sports. But he's also a massive Parramatta Eels fan, which I love. So welcome to the Paracave podcast, Mr. Paul Gow. Hey, mate, enough of the mister. Uh, good to be on, Troy. Uh, I listened to you. I've known about you with all your para gear around. I thought I was the biggest tragedy, but you win hands down. <laughs> uh, thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Well, 
we'll kick off with what is the Paul Gow story? Where did you grow up and what was growing up like for you as a kid? Yeah, well, I grew up at uh, pretty much the early life. I was born in Coonabarabra and went out in the bush, one of six kids. Um, I'm the youngest, so I took mum and dad six goes before they got it right. <laughs> um, but we moved to the city when I was about six months old. We were in town and um, we moved to North Rocks. So okay. but at the lower part of North Rocks, right at North Parramatta. And um, that's where it all started. Went to North Mead High School there. Pretty much a dropout. I was terrible because I, you know, wouldn't pay attention at school and hit <laughs> golf balls all afternoon and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, with the dreams one day to be a professional golfer. I tried rugby league. Yeah. Believe it or not, at school I played a little bit of soccer, but I tried rugby league. Went on. They put me on the wing. Big dude hit me. I just walked off. And the coach goes, "Where are you going?" I said, "Not for me." I said, "I'll just hit golf balls for a living." So, um, but that started my fascination with the. The, the, the game of rugby league, actually, my next-door neighbour in North Rocks, he um, he was the one, he was a big para fan. Okay. Um, my family weren't totally into rugby league, but Dad played a little bit back in Coonabarabran, but not 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 much into it. So um, when I was about five or six, my next-door neighbour, Freddie uh, Morton, he uh, was a massive para fan. He'd, um, every time para would win, he'd do a, a streak up and down his hallway. So that <laughs> that means that, you know, I learn about that. So that's what I did when para was on and um, just fell in love with him. Obviously, um, you know, back in those days, uh, it was it was awesome to watch Cumberland Oval and I went to Cumberland Oval, Oval a couple of times before they burn it down. Um, <laughs> And it just, I fell in love with the game. I think it's one of the the greatest sports of all time. I, I, I actually get shitty at this time of the year when there's no rugby league on. <laughs> yeah, nah, fair enough, fair enough. What was Cumberland Oval like? Because I, I never got there myself. I've only seen the pictures and heard the stories about it. But being the old dust bowl that it was, what, what was the Cumberland Oval <laughs> like? Well, I had an atmosphere I can remember. Like, I was pretty young, really. Like, when you go to... You know, somewhere like Combank now, or you go to Lang Park, or well, it's not Lang Park anymore. It's um, what's it called now? Suncorp. Uh, yeah, Suncorp. Like, there's a real atmosphere, and I remember going there, and all the parochial para fans yelling and screaming, and you know, you sit sit on these old sort of wooden seats and stuff like that, and um, like the hill was. That's where I first went, and as a kid, you run around trying to catch the ball yeah. and doing all that sort of stuff and tackling and. Um, but I, you know, I was a bit of a nerd of a kid too, so I, I watched a lot of the game too. But it was, um, it needed to be upgraded. I can see why they burned it down. It was pretty crappy, and uh, then we had a pretty good stadium for twenty odd or twenty five years until the new one. So, uh, but it was cool. Like not, yeah, you know, living up in North Rocks. Well, the lower part, in the Spears Road, which it, it's the last street in North Rocks before you get to North Parramatta. It, um, you know, you could pretty much walk to the the stadium from there. It was, uh, it was pretty cool, and everyone. In our, you know, I went to North Rocks Public School. Everyone was pretty much a Parramatta fan, so that was that was cool too. So you'd, I'd have the big bus ride to uh, school of a daytime, uh, you know, uh, with a mate of mine, and all we'd talk about was footy on the weekend and all that sort of stuff. So um, uh, it was quite funny actually. There was a mate and I. We both stuttered like we okay. couldn't, like our speech was terrible. So it was a twenty-five minute bus ride and. A, and yeah, we talk about footy, but we'd only give out like the first fifteen minutes of the game because we were studying, stuttering so much. So thank God I don't do that anymore. But um, yeah, it was uh, coming over was cool. It, it, it was a really good experience. Yeah, no, I have always said that uh, para fans are smart. We win the comp in '81 and burn down the stadium, and <laughs> means you just have to get a new one built. So. Um, Certainly, some really good times in those early days. Um, what What are your memories of those early days, those early grand finals, and being a kid growing up supporting the Eels? It must have been good times. Yeah, well, it's fun now, right? Looking back on it, when Fox Sports play the old games, and um, I remember when I first Mac moved back to uh, Australia, it was so about 2010-11. And um, we we're about to go out for a barbecue with some friends. And I hadn't lived here for 15 years, sort of come back for a month at a time. And um, I turned on Fox Sports and there was like the 81 grand final. I was like, oh, my goodness. So we couldn't go to the barbecue until it was finished. Yeah, I was yeah. like, we're not going anywhere. Um, but the memories are, are, are awesome, especially the grand finals. It's a big day and it's a, you know, it was a long day. I, like I like the three o'clock start. Yeah. You know, I'm not a big fan of the late start, but I can understand it from a broadcaster's point of view. Um, but you know, the, you know, watching our team like 
you know, Ray Price and Peter Sterling and Eric Groth and Mick Crone and Ella and Brett Kenny. Like, it was just a pack of superstars in there that they were all like mates and they all played for each other. And there was, you know, they just, it was a hard game. Right now, like the, the game right now is a tough game, no yeah. doubt. But they were pretty tough back then. A lot of skill level and, and watching, you know, Sterling Kenny go at it was just just amazing. Like just to you know watch them and craft their their stuff, and and then from Jack Gibson, you know, being the you know the the coach that you just looked at and you were sort of in awe of him. I actually got to play golf with him okay. years later, believe it or not. When I turned pro, I played with him in a in a pro am at New Brighton Golf Club, and it was one of the highlights of my life. Actually, is oh, to yeah. play with him. He was actually partially blind. On it was pretty blind. He had a uh, a guy would line him up and hit shots, and he was a man of few words. He's obviously aging you by that time, but um, it was a fantastic experience because I'd watched him through his time as a coach, and and you know one of the best ever, isn't it? You know, you obviously Bellamy and and Bennett are, are up there, but Jack Gibson was pretty cool. So just to get to meet him and and play eighteen holes of golf with him was oh, yeah, wow. was pretty damn cool. It, uh, I asked him some questions, but I I, I pretty much shut up. After a while, because he's way smarter, like he just come back with great answers, and so. But that time was fantastic. I guess that's what you hold on to as a para fan is you hang on to the eighties. And people lay shit on me, but <laughs> yeah, the last thirty years, you know, why do you, why are you after, why do you back the years? Why don't you find a real team? All this sort of crap, and really, it, it's what's in you. It's you know, you, you live and die by every game they play, and um, you know, watching those guys back then and. The three Pete and and just so prominent every year. Yeah, your team was in the finals every year, which was so bloody good. But to watch them, you know, Mick Cronin toe poking that ball and how he'd stand up in a tackle and offload and no bastard would, you know, could tackle him to the ground was just fantastic. So uh, yeah, it's such a clear memory. I I've done a lot of brain cells in my time, um, <laughs> but I can remember a lot of that stuff. Um, Mick Cronin, he probably. Look, he's a champion player, um, uh, and um, he probably doesn't get the raps that your Kennys and Sterlings and, and Price does. He's sort of um, a, like he, obviously a champion player, but um, many people think that he should become an immortal of, of rugby league. Um, what are your thoughts on the immortal debate? I mean, because I'm disappointed as a para fan that not one of those 80s players. <laughs> Is an immortal of rugby league? Well, I, you know what? It, it's always an opinion, right? It's like an asshole. Everyone's got one, <laughs> yeah. so you know it, it's it's all an opinion. But when you look at that team through the eighties, they were a real team. There wasn't really a standout. Sterling and um, definitely Kenny were were great players, but they weren't a standout. They were sort of like they were a team that played together. Oh, I'm not from a team sport. Never really played a team sport, okay. so I don't. Yeah. I can't comment on that team atmosphere inside the locker room, all that sort of stuff. I only go by what I hear. But that just looks like there's no individuals. And I think sometimes that that debate about the immortals, they're the individuals that stand out in their team, right? They're the ones that pull them along. I think everybody in this team were a leader, like from okay. Ray Price doing what he was doing, from Ella, yeah, with his brilliance, um, I think... Yeah, I guess that's would be my own analogy of it. You know, watching Andrew Johns through the prime and cutting us up there in two thousand and one, like it, it just it, he could do it. Um, where those guys were just all a bit of a team. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a great analogy, but I, I think that's why we're you know why we haven't got an immortal there. And I hope, in the sense of immortals, that they really do think about. They're just not going to throw somebody in there because they won a few titles. I think it's a, it's something you should cherish. Like I hear the word "great" a lot, um, overused in the, in in the terminologies of sports. Um, I think the immortal has to sit above great. Okay, yeah, no, that's a good way to say it. There, that um, as you said, those that are immortals probably not so much carried their team, but stood out in their team. Um, yeah, they and, certainly and did. And as you said, with Paravara, they had a number of them that helped every every week so um do you have a so then is it difficult to support the eels from overseas 
Yeah, it, it, it was. It was when hard back then. So ninety six was the first time I went over there. Um, but I was fortunate enough in ninety five. I played a, a pro in with the great Johnny Gibbs from Manly. So oh yes, um, and then started to play a bit of golf with Fatty. So okay. the three of us are, are, are close mates. Uh, they've both caddied for me at different times. We've got some funny stories with those guys caddying for me at different times when we were in Australia. Fat used to come over to the US and spend some time with us at the end of the tour, him and his wife. Um, so it was quite amazing. I hated Manly so much. And then two of my best mates um, uh, are Manly players and good Manly players, right? Yeah. So. Um, so Fatty was working at Channel 9 and um, he got the producers there to put me a whole heap of tapes together and like VHSs back then yeah. and then started, you know, into a into a disc. So every month they would send me the games so I could re-watch them. I know the result. Yeah. Um, so the answer to your question, yeah, it is hard to follow. Uh, not like these days. It's so bloody easy. You know, I don't miss a game when I go ahead to the US to do some work or around the world. I, I don't miss a game. You know, it's just, it's awesome. Um, you know, the live streaming stuff. So, but we may do somehow. So they'd send me over like the state of origins and all that sort of stuff. And I'd do benders. I would just watch, you know, <laughs> you know, game on game on game on my weeks off and, and not miss a thing. And actually, funny enough, I was going through some old things. Now we live back in Australia that we'd brought back in old tapes um, just to get them converted over to a, like a hard drive, oh, and yeah. there was a bunch of these old games yeah. in there. So yeah. oh. I'm going to get them changed so I can watch them again. I know Fox Sports will have them, but um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So yeah, nice. uh, it was good because we had had a few guys over there that were, you know, rugby league supporters. They weren't all just AFL supporters. Um, so Rod Pampling, Queenslander, John Senden, but my biggest rival was Peter Lonard, who was a massive bulldog supporter okay. and still is. Yeah. So, I love when they go shit. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fair enough. Well, well, that sort of probably leads me into my next question. Who, as a Parramatta fan, who is your, um, who's the favourite team that you'd love to beat? Who's the biggest rival as a fan? Yeah, I guess it changes from year to year. I, I reckon for me, I don't. I, I reckon I've got such an admiration for all these rugby league players that play. They they put they train their ass off. They put their body on the line for entertainment for us. Um, yeah, to go and sit in the stands and and we're we're entertained for a couple of hours. And um, so so I look at all the teams. I actually don't dislike a team at all. Like okay. the Bulldogs because of Peter Lonard. That's yeah. the only reason because you know. Um, I wanted them to get beaten because of, of him. Yeah, you know, it was great when they when they lost all their points and um, uh, they went from leading to zero, 42 points. I think they had up or something. They went to zero. So that year, what I did is for Lana because I forever playing practical jokes on him. I I wasn't actually on the PJ tour. I was on the secondary tour that year. So I sent out. Uh, it was 13 weeks to go. I sent out to my mate on tour. Uh, who was the Nike rep, actually, 13 wooden spoons. And every week he'd put a new wooden spoon in Lonard's locker. And he was getting so freaking frustrated. And then at the end of the season, and plus at his house in Orlando, because we lived about five, ten minutes from each other, uh, we went and spread, me and the kids, went and spread a whole heap of wooden spoons around the house and in the backyard. And everywhere he'd open a door and there'd be another wooden spoon. And then at the end of the season back in Australia, um, once again, I wasn't there, so I had someone in the presentation um, presenting with a big mahogany wooden <laughs> spoon with a with a um, a little um, plaque on there, you know, um, yeah, wooden spoon winners, bulldogs, blah blah blah. So uh, I had a bit of fun with that. Well, that was good. That sort of kept us grounded when we were over there, having a little bit of a um, you know, you know, rivalry with the teams, but. Um, yeah, you know, I think it changes from year to year with the play, like what teams that you you dislike or yeah. it's it's normally personal. It's only about um, your team and you know something they've done or you know they've won off a forward pass and you're like ah oh, there's shit you know so you know. But I, I I really take my hat off to all the players. It's it's great. You know I watch every game on every weekend and if if I miss it it's taped and I'll I'll be up until midnight to watch it. So um, yeah, they're all good. Yeah, I think um, not so. Oh, recent, not so recently. It was Melbourne for me. <laughs> uh, recently, now being a para fan, living in Penrith, it's Penrith. So, um, 
and them having so much success. But, I mean, they they are a champion team. But my favourite game of the year is Parramatta and Penrith at Penrith. So, um, Yeah, I've been to one. I've been to a couple, actually, and um, um, they're, they're, they're interesting. They're interesting. You walk in with the, you know, your blue and yellow on and the abuse that you're getting is outrageous. <laughs> it's. Um, I remember taking my we'd, – we'd come home – mid-season my daughter's about six and so i've got two daughters and my wife's a para fan like we went to high school together and yeah it's yeah that was a given you had to be a para fan she was anyway (laughs) um so my daughters are para fans uh so i took my oldest one and we walk in we're going to the other side of the ground and the abuse that we got i'm holding a (laughs) six-year-old daughter's hand the language was outrageous it was terrible um, to get over there, and, and she said to me, she said, Dad, they're not too happy with us. And I said, yeah, I think we wore, wore the wrong colours tonight. <laughs> so Yeah, well, not much has changed, I don't think, at Penrith with their fans, <laughs> I don't think, to be honest. But, Bit of what, passion. What, yeah, well, one of my favourite sledges is, as as you know, like wearing your Parramatta gear at Penrith, there's like, oh, go back to Parramatta, where you belong, or something like that. It's like, oh, living in Penrith, I turn around and say, well, I only live five minutes away, so... <laughs> Yeah. And, and they, they say, like, well, what are you wearing that crap for? It's like, well, I turn around to them and say, well, what are you wearing that crap for? So uh, it's <laughs> uh, always... They've done well. It's it's great to watch good teams like that. It's like Broncos in their time and uh, the Brisbane Lions in their time. It's great to see um, teams like Penrith. And obviously it was tough to watch at the ground last year, but they were just the better team. They were, you know, they're... They're well versed. Um, their, their depth between the juniors are ridiculous. Ivan Clear and the team out there and have done an amazing job. And um, even if you don't like them, you've got to, you know, applaud how how well they've gone about it. And it's not easy to three peat. And you know, they could four peat the way they go. Yeah. <laughs> they could keep going. Yeah, no, definitely. Just uh, on the overseas thing, uh, can you recall of a place that you've seen an Eels jersey uh, or some memorabilia around the place overseas? Yeah, my my house, actually. I had a sign <laughs> made up in my office in my house in Orlando that said, if you're not a Parramatta supporter, uh, don't come in. Um, but, yeah, I, all the time you always see different people. Chicago was an interesting area because a lot of a lot of um, Australians were up there for some unknown reason and uh, para supporters. So, yeah, just on the random you would see LA more than anything else, okay. I guess, yeah. uh, that I've seen para jerseys and, and hats and different things. But, you know, um, yeah, Chicago, I remember playing there. I was actually in contention playing well. And next thing I hear this, go para. <laughs> and I, like I'm looking over, there's thousands of people there because Tiger Woods played that week. And I'm like, I can't see a hat or anything, but it was just a random out of the middle yeah. of nowhere. My my caddy at the time is a guy called Dave Nielsen who lives on the Central Coast. Um, and he's a big para fan too. And so he pretty much got the job because I'd had a bunch of Americans <laughs> Uh, one guy had moved on and then I come back to Australia and and Dave was there and I said, mate, who do you follow? And Rugby League said, oh, para like you. I said, well, good, you got the job. So um, That's it was awesome. Yeah. And it get, you know, to be honest, it gave us something to talk about in between shots. Okay. You know, we would talk about, you know, who was coming up in the reserve grade, who was coming up in the jersey flag, who was – so just instead of thinking about golf the entire time, we were talking about how good or bad – Para went that week, you know, on results and we'd look at all the, the stats and all that sort of stuff. So it was great having Dave on the bag. It was, it was like being at home that, um, um, yeah. So when he left, actually, I struggled with caddies, American caddies, because I just didn't have a lot to talk about. I got into the NFL a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. So it was, is yeah. So I haven't got many... Um, sort of vices in life, but it's obviously playing golf, but that was my living. It's... Parramatta Eels or rugby league and horse racing, so they're it. I don't don't buy fancy cars. I don't buy fancy clothes or watches or anything like that. They're they're my things. I love doing those uh, three things. So some pretty would, simple bloke. So, some would probably say that that's probably a um, maybe a, a bad thing, like to concentrate on something else rather than uh, <laughs> your game at the time, I guess. But I mean, you're saying it was a good thing. Oh, that was a great thing. Oh, no, fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Golf's a weird game. I don't know if you've ever played it, but it's... Um, oh, a few it, times, uh, badly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just gets in your head and all that sort of stuff. So you've got to get all that crap out. And it's fun. It's, it's you know, walking up and just... You could then concentrate. Well, we train to 
to, to focus. So that's what we do within practice is, 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 you know, focusing in on that one minute and that 30 seconds that you're actually going to go and pull the trigger and hit the shot. So to take your mind away, midstream is really good and having a good caddy, you know, they can bring outside agencies into, into calculation for you and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it was a really – it's actually a really good thing. And any sports sites you see, um, they actually um, applaud it. Okay. Nice, nice. Well, as an Aussie uh, living in the US, we see now the rugby league going over there in round one, going to Las Vegas. Yeah. How, how do you think that'll be received over there next year in, in round one? In Vegas. Oh, the first thing they'll be amazed is that no one wears pads. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. The, that's the thing. All my American friends, when I showed them a, you know, a, a game, oh, man, they're not wearing pads or a helmet, man. Yeah, <laughs> wow. They're tough. Wow. So, and I've taken a few of the Americans that have come out here, I've taken them to games. And so they're amazed with that. Um, yeah, 330 million people over there. I can see the point you now trying to get into that market. But there, there's, yeah, I, I don't know if it'll happen, really. I know there's a little, there's a little, pods over there like cricket in spots in new york and around um uh, up north there um they have a bit of cricket here and there i don't know if rugby league it's it's just a bit of an exhibition sort of game type of thing i don't think you'll ever get a team in there or a or a franchise as, as they have their nfl their ice hockey their basketball their college ball you know they grow up on these things that yeah. that's what the amazing bit when val holmes and and jared hayne went over there um, you got to you got to understand their culture over there. There's a lot of kids, and I mean a lot of kids, unlike here, that uh, are born in these shitty little towns, and their way out of that town is possibly in sport. So, you know, if you show any ability with NFL or or, or hockey or basketball. You know, it's your way to get out of that town to get to a bigger town to go to college, and then the college system is ridiculously good. They're so professional, so they're born into this. So, you know, they know all the plays, they know how it. So, it, it's, it was a big effort for those guys to go over and because they weren't born on it. They were born on our sports like cricket and rugby league yeah. and AFL. Yeah. Um, they're our national sports and. Over there, their national sports, there's, you know, they and they work so hard, these kids and these people, players, men and women, to get out of their towns to get into these teams. So they want it more. They're so hungry, it's ridiculous. I've never seen hunger like it. Um, there's a secondary tour over there on the US tour called the Corn Ferry Tour. It was always named the Nike Tour. And they're the hungriest golfers in the world because they're not playing for a lot of money. Um, they're trying to get to the big tour, the PGA tour. So they work they work so damn hard and they are so focused. So uh, it's a difficult one um, for it. But so, hey, great that they're going over there. The boys will get to see Vegas. It's a pretty cool town. Um, Vegas for me, you know, we, I'd go there every year to play a tournament. Uh, you know, we'd start a thing. You'd stay off the drink. You'd stay away from the tables. Um, you'd just go back there when you wanted to have a drink and um, you know, have a bit of fun. But yeah. it's um, yeah, Vegas is three or four days for me, and that's enough. So, uh, but anyway, it'll be interesting to see. I don't, I don't know what the outcome's going to be. Um, you know, who knows? Is it a tourism piece? Is it, you know, are they going to take a couple of games across there per year? Is it a broadcasting? I don't know. Yeah. So, um, but good luck to the ones that get the trip. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it for sure. Now, speaking of um, golf and, and rugby league, uh, last year on the show that you had in 2022, the golf show on Fox Sports, you played around with Clint Gutherson and Mitchell Moses. How did, yeah. how did, how did, how did that go? It was good. What good. Are they I like as golfers? With, yeah, I know they're both really good golfers, actually. Um, two different types of golfers. I played with them a few times before, and I played with um, RCG also, and yeah. he's a good golfer too. He he smashes at his big unit far out. He can smash it. Um so, yeah, we played a few games before that and oh, a couple of years of it and here and there randomly we'll play a couple of times a year and um, it's quite amazing, um, their personalities. You've got uh, Clint Gutherson who could run through a brick wall who's got the highest energy, who's never had a golf lesson in his life. Yeah, okay, wow. Um, and uh, he just does it his way but he, he wills that golf ball into the hole um, with enthusiasm and confidence and Mitch was... Got a beautiful, actually a really good golf swing and doesn't know how good a golfer he is. Okay. Um, and he plays, he's a, he's actually a better golfer than 
Clint, but uh, he doesn't shoot the same scores as Clint. Now, if you could put the two together, you'd have a really good golfer. I mean, a really good golfer. Okay. So I think I think um, Mitch is maturing, and he's not as hard on himself on the golf course anymore. He's he's you know now a dad. And, uh, you know, got other responsibilities and probably not as hard on himself on the golf course. But they're good fun guys to play with. Um, I don't ask them anything about footy, really. Um, we, we, we play golf and we talk about other things. And, um, you know, I'm not – I don't want to be a fanboy at all, so I don't ask those questions. I'm one of those fans that just go and sit there and enjoy the, the game. I'll yell at the referee occasionally here <laughs> and there and the TV. and um, But – yeah, it's good to know those guys. You know, we're talking about professional sports and different things, and yeah, they're, they're good guys. And they're, you know, what the, the the thing is, if everyone was the same, it'd be a pretty boring world. So, um, and they were good in that episode. They were yeah. funny as shit. They were, um, they just, it's amazing that the crap they lay on each other. Yeah. And um, I was hoping they did that day, and they they did. It was actually. When they play together, they're actually they lay more shit on each other. It's very funny. <laughs> yeah, nah, it would be great to be there for sure. Um, what about some of the past players who who are really good, who are really good golfers that you've played with in the past? I know Sterlo's a a keen avid golfer. Yeah, um, Sterlo. Yeah, he's a good golfer. Yeah, he plays well. He's always been a single finger handicap and. Um, uh, he's a member up at Castle Hill, and I was a member there for years. So I got to meet. Um, it's pretty surreal, actually, to meet one of your idols and um, play a bit of golf and uh, consider him a mate. And um, um, I, when I first started the show about six years ago, I actually rang Pete. I said, "Mate, can you help me out? I'm going to do this show with celebs. Would you be my first guest? Because um, I know stuff all about TV, and I know you do." So the first episode took us about five or six hours to film. It only takes two and a half to three hours to film, but yeah. Pete was very patient with me and, and helped me out. And, um, uh, yeah, he was the very first one. And that first year we only did ten episodes. And Pete won the – he was leading the nearest the pin challenge all year. I mean, <laughs> no one was close to him. He'd hit a really good shot and he'd ask me, am I still leading, am I still leading? <laughs> And lo and behold, my last guest was Damien Oliver, oh. and Ollie hit it into about three feet. So he hit it in a lot closer than Pete. So um, yeah, he was um, uh, he was a bit pissed off with that. But no, he's cool. I, I catch up with Sterlo. He's he's awesome to play golf with, and he can play. But out of the foot rugby league players, I've heard there's a lot. I'd love to get Callum Ponger on. Um, he was a really good junior. Um, but I've had Latrell Mitchell on this year on the show and, um, geez, he, he got delivered some God given talents because he, he swung the club beautifully. And if he put his mind to it, he could be a lot lower handicap. He's like a nine handicapper, but, um, if he really put some time and effort, I reckon he'd get down to the two or three handicap. And, um, for a big fella, he had a beautiful golf swing. He controlled the ball. He knew a lot about it. He was a he's a really good guess. Um, I know he's probably one of those players we all look at times. He's a bit of a lunatic on the on the field, but on the golf course, he was um, cool, calm, and collected. And hit, geez, he hit a lot of good shots. Hit a mile, but then had feel and and a bit of grace. So um, yeah, I've had there's a bunch of who else have I had on? Oh, geez, we've had over eighty guests, and I've got to be really careful for for this show <laughs> because I'm such a rugby league fan and nut. Is that I just don't make it all rugby league yeah, you players. Yeah, mix it up a bit. <laughs> got to mix it up. So um, I've got to have AFL. I've got to have cricketers on. I've got to have musicians on. And um, I'd love to just do a full on rugby league one because there's plenty of the rugby league players. I, I believe we Hargraves. He, he's a pretty good golfer. Ben Hornby. I've been told oh, he's yeah. a good golfer. I've never met him, um, but he's a, he's a good golfer. I'd love to get him on the show sometime. Um, I've had. Um, Oh, Pappenhausen. Pappenhausen goes all right. He's a deep thinker about the game. Um, real strategy type of player. Gets his way around and, and maps his way around. Just it's a good question. I'd have to go back and see who I've had. I, <laughs> yeah. I sort of lose focus on who I've had because I've had well over 80 guests now. So, um, But, you know, I, I, I play with them. It's interesting. You, with all these professional athletes, um, they're all egotistical maniacs of some sort. They've got this confidence and air of um 
air of confidence, I would say, that they're, they're pretty damn good. And, and there's a reason why they've put the time and effort into to what they do. So I'm always thrilled to listen to their journeys and how they've got there and, you know, whether what influences have had, uh, what people have had influences on them, um, you know, in their careers, not outside of golf. So I really don't talk to them about their their actual career of their sport yeah like i had kelly slater on this year i didn't ask him any surfing questions all about his golf so it's actually a golf show so that's yeah. what we talk about so um yeah so I, there's a heap of heap to go to get on the show like there's they all the rugby league players pretty much all play golf so um i'm hoping to get the travoyevich boys on because oh, i know yeah. they play golf yeah um Tedesco brushed me this year because oh. he, he he got you know, he was supposed to be like the first filming this year, but he uh, something come up. So I'm hoping to get him this year. Him and Mitch play a little bit of golf together. So um, yeah, so I'm hoping to sort of make my way through there. But I've got to be careful. I can't have 15 episodes of 15 rugby league players. Nah, I think what you're going to have to do. I think instead of all these rugby league players doing the boxing these days, I think we might have to set up a rugby league golf tournament or something like that in the off season. Could be, yeah, not a bad idea. That, yeah, um, yep. just I'm sure the, that all play. Yeah, all play, so, yeah, um, nah, definitely. I think that'd be a a, a great way to go. Um, do you have a? You mentioned your sign in Orlando there, but do you have any other favourite pieces of memorabilia, eels memorabilia that you've collected from over the years? Oh, I have. I've got one jersey that uh, Sterlo gave me for my thirtieth birthday, and it had um, Gow on the back. So he gave me a jersey of his, one of his jerseys, uh, years ago, and then for my thirtieth birthday, he gave me him and Fatty gave me a, a para one with Gowie on the back, and um, so that's. That that sits pride and place in my closet with you know a couple of jackets I won playing tournaments and winning and um, yeah so it, that, that that's pretty special. But there is a, um, a pair of shoes that you ever see me go to a game. I've been with Nike, a uh, sponsored athlete for twenty five, twenty six years this year, and back about twelve or thirteen years ago. Um, they said, "I oh, didn't. Do, do you want anything?" And I said, "I'd like a pair of custom." blue and yellow shoes made with the eels on there so they made me these awesome shoes so they're the only ones in the world wow. no one else has got them um i wear them to the game i occasionally i think i've put them on instagram once or twice but um so they sit pretty high up in my um shoe rack so i don't as i said i don't buy myself you know expensive things and i don't collect things other than a few shoes here and there and they're all got nike on them anyway but they sit at the top uh of my most custom made shoes geez i reckon um nike would make a fortune if they released those to Parramatta fans for sure that i mean I, everyone would buy them i would imagine so so um yeah they're, they're pretty cool yeah no nah, definitely um uh, what's your um favorite grand final victory out of the four that we've had so far is there one that stands oh, out? No, I don't think. Well, beating Manly, <laughs> twice, <is>, twice, <laughs> is pretty damn good. Like, um, and and they had a pretty good team around that time too, and all that sort of stuff. And they had household names: Graham Eady and, and Johnny Gibbs and Fatty and oh, geez, keep going, Thompson and all those guys going down the list. There, Gardner was a, a great. Um, it, it was a really, really good. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. To, um, yeah, he was a yeah really good winger there. Uh, so probably you know, those two, eighty two and eighty three, ridiculous. So um, yeah, I, I guess one of the worst was two thousand and one. I'd flown all the way back oh. from the US tour. It was an amazing year for me. Two thousand and one. Um, my wife. We had our first child, um, and. I made it onto the US tour for the first time, so I'm going to play with the likes of Tiger Woods and Ernie Eels and all those guys. Um, Para makes it at the grand final. I've still got about four or five or six weeks left on tour, and uh, I got a call. Would you, you know, would you be interested in coming home and sitting up in the uh, NRL box and uh, for the grand final? And uh, so I jumped on the plane, and my wife and um, I, we come home and. Um, it was it was a great week. I soaked it all up, and I went to the grand final, and 
you know, the first half wasn't great. It was awful. Um, it was like I was at a funeral. Yeah. Um, but people don't, you know, it, it finished 30-24 and people don't realise that Para won the second half. I <laughs> know they didn't win it overall. 24-6. But I keep saying, yeah, we won the second half. So, you know, Newcastle were pretty damn good. But that was a... Yeah, it was a long way to come to watch him get beaten, but it was, it, geez, it was really worth it. The, you know, um, you know, I rolled up, I was proud as punch, and then I flew back to the US the next day and finished the last four or five, six weeks in the US. And, um, yeah, yeah, some people might think I was a little bit crazy, but you never know when your team's going to be in the grand final, do you? Well, that's it. That was my first Eels grand final that I'd, I'd been to, and, yeah, I was devastated that day um, <laughs> for that loss. But, yeah. Um, much like this season, what are your thoughts about this season this year, twenty twenty three? It was a bit of a bit of a downer for us para fans. Hard to watch at times. Um, hey, everything goes in a bit of a cycle. I think in in life in general. Um, I noticed yeah, in, in my sport, it's definitely a cycle. Um, I don't think it's an easy job being someone who recruits players. Um, it's a difficult thing. So. Um, I was just worried just watching them every week. Like I was like, oh, I just we haven't got our full team in, all that sort of stuff. You can make plenty of excuses, but it's the team that's in there. I think it's hard to be a first grade rugby league player. Like um, I, I quite often go down to Kellyville and watch the reserve graders because I want to see who's coming up and yep. you know a bunch of good players coming this year. Like Brennan Hands, Jaden Yates, um, that was cool. I'm sure we got some coming up through Jersey Flag too that you know, we'll get a run in reserve grade and then make their way. So it's fun following my daughter and I. We follow the – we try to follow – she's a para fan too. She, you know, follows them from Jersey flagging up and she's, oh, Dad, there's a you know, young kid come along. Oh, they nice. rate him. And, you know, we got him from Penrith or we got him, you know, from wherever. She knows him back to front. So um, it's fun watching that. So when you have down years like this, you're just hoping they rebuild and, um, you know, they, they, they move on and they – yeah, you, know, you learn from it as a professional athlete. That's and, and me just worrying about me uh, when I play the game of golf. I, I've got a, I've actually got a at the end of every year, or end of every month, and even in end of every week is is summarise what you've done well and what you've done bad, and then you act accordingly to that and and go and change things that aren't working and and um, hopefully they work for the better. So yeah, it was tough to watch, but yeah, um, I, I still watch them the whole way through like yeah. it doesn't matter if we're getting beaten by 30 i you know i still watch it then i still i still don't understand i got mates who turn the tv off and go oh that's shit i'm not watching it anymore of their team i'm like i just love watching them run around and you know you never know what the next play is going to be and what they do and um yeah it's um it, it, it's hard to watch but hey you know we've got some by you know we got uh old mate from uh Kalamatangi, didn't we from over at uh, Manly there, so it's yeah. always good to steal one from there. We stole Gutho from there. We stole Sean <laughs> Lane from there. Yeah, we love stealing people from Manly. Um, so, you know, we're in for a better year. We've got, you know, think about, you know, Dunster and Russell. They're only young guys coming into the game. So, you know, it's got to evolve a team. I'm glad we've kept Mitch. That was that was a good signing to, to keep hold of him. Um, so... Hopefully we're in for a better season. Yeah, well, I mean, we all hope that they win the comp next year, but what are your hopes or, or predictions for 2024? Uh, I, I think they're building again. I think it's got to that point, and it's about Brad Arthur, you know, and his team and Mark O'Neill, the recruiters, to bring in that, and they know who they've got coming up in the in the junior ranks, and so they'll, they've obviously got a plan of some sort, or we as um, fans hope they've got a plan yeah. uh, to go into next year, and there'll be players that move their way out um, that that will you know possibly go over and play overseas. So um, I, I think it's really interesting how they got to jostle things around, and then you get injuries, so you throw that in there. Um, you know, um, it's even tougher because all of a sudden you've, you've you've trained in the off season. You know that to be a halfback, that to be a five eight. Um, you know, and then these are your wingers and these are your centres and all that sort of stuff and you train for that and then all of a sudden you get two or three, four injuries and you've got to shuffle people around. So um, Penrith seem to do it better than most. You know, they can fill people into spots. So whatever they're doing, um, we Let's possibly do should sort of probably <laughs> see to do it. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I had a discussion with a young fellow the other day that he thinks the success of Penrith all come from they all grew up with each other 
and they all, um, you know, they all just they buy into each other's experiences and they don't want to let each other down. And you know, as I said, I've never been in a team, so I don't know that team, um, you know, sort of camaraderie at all. But, um, you know, hopefully we get a bunch of young kids that have come through the system. You know, I know the, the junior Parramatta um, sides, you know, we've got juniors everywhere. We just hopefully we get the ones and they all play together. Um, but I'm hoping, um, you know, if we make the finals, that, that's a start, and I reckon yeah. if you get into the final, especially the top four, anything can happen at that time. And um, you know, it's just a matter of you know managing your rosters and how you do it. So I I think it's fascinating how they do it, the, you know, week in, week out, and people have got niggling injuries and all that sort of stuff. How you know the science of managing that these days is is far superior from when the boys played in the eighties. That's for sure. Yeah, no, let's just hope we, as you said, make the finals and then anything can happen from there. Well, time for some, uh, I usually call them the common league questions. Um, yep. But I'll probably have a bit of a golf twist on them. Um, yep. So instead of favourite game that you've played, the favourite round of golf that you've ever played? Favourite round of golf. That, is there one that stands out where you just, oh, I just love that that round or that tournament? Yeah, sure is. Uh, I shot a score of 60, 12 under par at Castle Hill in the Cannon Challenge, uh, which is a, a, like a, a record in this country. Um, so that was – and I played alongside Aaron Badley and Stephen Leaney. Um, that was one of my most memorable uh, rounds ever. It still holds up 20 years later. Ah, nice, nice. Uh, ever hit a hole in one? I've had 19 holing ones. 19, wow. 19. I can't get to 20. I'm trying really hard to get to 20. And I'm going to try to play. I don't play a lot of golf these days, so I'm going to try to play a little bit more. I'm going to play a tournament at the end of the year. I'm actually going down to play Wagga Wagga this week in a Pro-Am down there, so I'm looking forward to that. They're big um, rugby league supporters. A fun town, that one. So maybe I'll get one down there and finally get to 20. So, yeah, 19. Wow. Most people struggle to hit one and... You've got yep. 19, amazing. Yeah, well, I get more of a, I, I've had more of an opportunity yeah. over the last 40 years than most. Yeah, true, true. So other than your home uh, course, did you have a favourite golf course that you played at? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, there was a number in the US that I, I loved. Uh, down in Melbourne, my favourite down there, there's there's a couple actually, um, Metropolitan Golf Club and Peninsula Kingswood. They're, they're favourites. Here in Sydney, I love the Australian Golf Club in New South Wales. Um, I'm a member at Terry Hills, so I play out at Terry Hills. Uh, live at Castle Hill, but I, I, I trek out there. It's a beautiful golf course out there. And in the US, I was fortunate enough um, to play Augusta last year, so... It's now become my favourite in the US. It's such a beautiful place. And, oh, yeah, I bet. Um, I'm lucky through Fox Sports that I get to go there and help out the commentary and, the you know, showcasing the Australians that are over there. Um, so, it's yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. So if you ever get a chance or any of your listeners get a chance to, to go to Augusta, take it up. It is, it is unbelievable. Yeah, no, no doubt. Is there a... Is there a least favourite one that you hate playing at for whatever reason? Not really, actually. No? Okay. It's um, well, one yeah, that you struggle with at all, or oh, there's plenty I struggle <laughs> with um, over the years. Oh, actually, yeah, there was one I actually, yeah, actually, Beth Page. I didn't dislike the golf course, but Beth Page up in New York, where we played the U.S. Open. It just was too hard for me. I was just, it was just so, but it, it's worth playing. I didn't hate it, but it was just one that never suited my eye. I hit the ball more left to right, and you needed to hit the ball more right to left. Um, but the biggest myth in the US, and when you get to the US Tour, is they've got all the best golf courses that you play on the US Tour. But the fact is it's not. Like all the courses that you don't play, all the private country clubs are possibly the best. So, um um, they just look good on TV, that's all. <laughs> no, fair enough. Uh, is there a player that you wanted to play with that you never got an opportunity to play around with? Yeah, probably um, a guy you, you wouldn't even know of is Nick Price. Um, he's a, um, from South Zimbabwe. Yeah. I always looked up to him, as I do of Greg Norman and Peter Thompson in the day and um, Wayne Grady. Uh, Peter Senior, always looked up to those guys uh, in Baker Finch. 
But, yeah, I would have liked to have played with Nick Price. I've met him a couple of times, um, but he was, uh, I would have loved his, the way he hit the ball and the way he played the game I really I really liked. But I never – he's he's probably 10 years older than me, so I didn't re- really ever get a chance to play with him. So I, I would have loved to have. Nice. Now, you mentioned uh, the wooden spoon prank a, a, a bit earlier. Um, yep. Who was a prankster beside yourself on, on the tours that you're on? And what did they get up to? Oh, yeah, there wasn't – actually, I was probably the – I was the captain of the world team, <laughs> you know, especially with the Aussies. Um, and Lonard and Gavin Coles were probably the two bunnies there, especially Lonard. Like, I had uh, this – you know, everything's free. All the companies on the US tour, everything's given to you, right? So you're just a bunch of sport brats. Anyway, there's a guy with golf – wooden golf tees. He came up to me and said, oh, Paul, do you um, – do you want some golf tees? I said, oh, yeah. He said, do you want them in your, you know, your your home team, your football team? A lot of the Australians are getting their AFL teams. Do you want your team? I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So he made me, like, I'm going to say it was 5,000 yellow golf wow. tees, right, yeah. with the eels on it. Yeah, right. Wow. So what I thought was a good idea is I got a bunch of those tees with the kids and I went and hid them in Lionard's house everywhere. I mean everywhere and I got Parramatta stickers and I stuck them under tables um, just absolutely everywhere so everywhere he looked in between his mattress so when he moved house he opened and next thing there's a hundred <laughs> couple hundred tees under there and then the guy made me another 500 another 5,000 in blue so I've still got a heap to this day that I, I, I went to golf yesterday with my mum and um, I pulled out a you know, a Parramatta tea, so oh, it's uh, nice. pretty cool. So I don't – I try not to use them these days so I haven't got that many left. Yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, there was a couple here here and there, but there's – none of them, they're pretty serious. So there's a couple of Americans, that, Trip Eisenhower, that I'd travel with. He was a bit of a prankster. So um, um, it's a gentleman sports, Troy. That's <laughs> the gentleman playing I'm, the game. I'm course. surprised you didn't turn him into a Parramatta supporter with all the – Parramatta stuff around his house. Oh, yeah. Well, no, he dislikes it. Did he ever get you back in uh, 2011, 12 and 18? Not really. He's not a great prankster. He made a little bit of a you know, prank on me one day that he told my daughter who he was babysitting for us in the land and she was three or three and a half or something, and he told her that, I know what d- your dad's going to buy you for Christmas. And she said, what? And he said, a pony. So... <laughs> When I got home that night, she says, um, uh, "She says, uh, hey, Dad, uh, Peter told me, Uncle Pete told me what uh, what you're going to buy me. You're going to buy me a pony. I said, you know Uncle Pete. He lies a lot. <laughs> so there's no chance you're getting a pony. And she goes, oh, okay. So I come to Christmas Day and um, I spoke to Lana and he goes, how's Christmas Day? Yeah, good. I said, oh, it was. But Tiana, you know, my daughter's crying a lot and she didn't get the pony that you, you, know, that you said I was going to get her. He goes, really? So then he rang our manager. We had the same manager, and the manager, he said, you're an idiot. He said, uh, we're not going to go buy a pony for Gary's kid. Um, he's having a go at you. He goes, no, no, no. He said she was crying. Nah, she wasn't crying at all. So he, that, he's not a great prankster, but um, but it's good talking footy with him because he, he loves his footy too. Now, if you didn't go down the playing golf path, what, what do you think you would be uh, doing as a career? I'd be a tradie of some sort. Yep. Not too smart. Um, so I would be not saying tradies aren't smart, but um, I don't know actually. I mean, because it, it, the fact is, mate, that I, at the age of 11 or 12, I knew exactly what I wanted to do for a job. Yep. I was always going to be a professional golfer um, of some sort, other than being a touring professional. That's what I wanted to be, but there's other parts of golf. Uh, um, that you could be without being a touring golf professional. So I was so bloody lucky that, you know, I had mates that went through, you know, uni and all that sort of stuff that still didn't know what they wanted to do for a job. But I was lucky from the age of 12 that I was pretty focused on what to do. So um, I actually went into the finance industry. When I come back from America in 2011, uh, I went in there to try out what a real job was like. I wore a suit and a tie, went to a place called Mortgage Port, um, um, I was business development um, in there, so that was interesting. I did that for three or four years, believe it or not, and um, just to see what everything was like, like what normal life was. Yeah. I'd been tripping around for all those years, uh, not living the high life. I didn't fly around in private jets and all that sort of stuff. I sat at the back of the bus, um, but it, it, it was good to, to see. I, I think it should be something in sports maybe that – you go and see what an accountant does or a financial planner or someone like that. So 
I've been more educated in the last 10 years than yeah. I was prior to that because I didn't pay attention at school. Um, <laughs> teachers thought I was on drugs because, you know, I didn't pay attention. I was too busy thinking of play, playing golf or drawing golf courses or clubs. And they actually said to my parents, we think you're your kid's on drugs, and my dad said there's not a chance. He comes home from school, makes himself a sandwich, gets a bunch of practice golf balls, goes back over to the school on the school island and hits balls until dark, so he's got no time for drugs. So um, pretty simple like that. Go- so, golf- yeah, I don't, I don't know what I'd be. Golf was your drug. Yep. All right, time for the, the quick top ten, and it's just a pretty much a simple yes or no or, or- Yep. Maybe or could be something different. I don't know. But um, cats or dogs? Dogs. Ford or Holden? Holden. Uh, pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Yes. Tea or coffee? Green tea. Uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Rambo or Rocky? Rocky. Nice, nice. Peanut butter or Vegemite? Uh, oh, both. Yeah? But Fair Okay, right. I've got to give an answer, so it'll be Vegemite. Nice. Morning or night person? A morning person. I'm out of bed early. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Uh, Seinfeld or Friends? Friends. Nice. And we'll wrap things up with the set of six, the personality sort of questions. Now, I usually say what's the favourite sport outside of rugby league, but you've got rugby league and golf. Uh, is there any outside of those that you enjoy watching? Or uh, oh, yeah, I enjoy all sports, but um, horse racing. So I, I think they're amazing jockeys and, and what they do and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, so they're, they're, they're my... In my sports, but I yeah, I enjoy watching all sports. Nice. Do you uh, gamble much on the on the horses? Yep, yep. I'm not a big gambler, but I, but I love watching them. Actually, didn't have a pun on the weekend because I was too busy cutting lawns and and um, doing the pool and all that sort of stuff. So I enjoyed a bit of garden work here and there. Nice. Well, you've been to many a destination across the world. Is there a favourite holiday destination? Maldives by far. Nice, nice. Uh, instead of meeting, who would be the most famous person you would um, or love to meet, dead or alive, but also maybe even have a, a round of golf with? Gary Packer. Nice. Um, which three former golfers wouldn't you want to be on a deserted island with and why? Three former golfers. Uh, well, it could be current if you want. Current, uh, Ro- Robert Allenby, because we don't really get on. Um, that'd be one. Uh, I gotta say, that's a hard one because majority of golfers are actually really nice. Okay. Like, I mean, yeah. they know how hard it is, um, you know, to play the game, and they, they've got some sort of appreciation for each other. So it's a really hard. Ro- Robert is. Probably what? Not, what uh, well, okay. Oh, well, probably Patrick Reed. Patrick Reed is on the US tour that cheats a bit. Um, uh, there's two, but other than that, the rest of them are. Put, uh, oh, Phil Mickelson. Sorry, there's three. I made. I got three. Okay. If, if Phil Mickelson was a Mars bar to eat himself, he's that fond of himself. Um, <laughs> so there's three. Yeah, actually, I got three out. There you go. But they'd be the three most. That's Jeez. it. <laughs> uh, what's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Uh, well, as I said, I'm a simple human, is that <laughs> I could eat a chicken salad every day of my life and I make a chicken salad pretty much every day. Yeah. I love chicken. Chicken's my thing. Um, I go right in the barbie. I was the worst cook of all time, so I had a, um, a mate gave me a lesson on it. Now I don't cook too bad, but I love a barbie. Um, I don't drink beer. I drink copious amounts of bourbon. Uh, I love bourbon. Um, that's sort of like a pastime for me. I collect bourbons and different ones, but I drink them too. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm okay. I'm not a good cook. We're not, yeah, just okay. Man. Don't worry, I'm not the best cook either. I'm just uh, yeah. bacon and eggs or sausages or steak. That's about it. Nothing nothing too fancy. Yeah, maybe one day I'll go and have lessons and cook something good. The guy I used to travel with, Trip Eisner, he was a, he was a chef and a good, good golfer too. And it was awesome, you know, rooming with him. We'd get a place that had, um, 
cooking facility and he'd cook. It was just I'd buy the material and the food was fantastic. End up looking like the side of a house because we'd <laughs> eat so well. But, um, but, yeah. Well, the last one, who's your favourite band or solo artist to listen to? Uh, Jimmy Barnes. Oh, mate, good taste. Good taste. Yeah, you guys are right. Yeah. Now, nah, what's your favourite Barnesy song or, or Chisel song? Oh, far out. Um, geez, there's so many. No one's ever asked me that. Uh, yeah. And I've been to that many Barnsley concerts. I actually had him on the show one year, um, which was pretty cool. Um, always like working class man. It's sort yeah. of... It sort of rang home with my family and everyone worked pretty hard in our family, so it sort of that was that was pretty cool. But did well, you go back flame trees, you yeah. just keep going. Well, you like just... like yourself in two thousand and one where you thought all the stars were aligning with the Parramatta Grand Final. I thought last year all the stars were aligning as well because Barnes is my favourite um yeah, solo artist and Chisel my favourite band and that he was playing at half time and Parramatta in the grand final against Penrith. I, th- I thought, yep, it's all aligning here. It's all happening. But <laughs> unfortunately, it didn't. But uh, nevertheless. Because you know there's a Penrith supporter that was thinking the exact same thing. It's yeah. all aligned for oh, them. No they're... doubt. No <laughs> doubt. No doubt. That's for sure. No doubt. Well, Paul Gal, thank you very much for joining me today on the Parrot K podcast. I could have talked for hours. So many interesting stories. And hopefully uh, one day we'll catch up at Combank Stadium at a game and we'll say good day and – uh, listeners and viewers, um, when does How Good Is Golf come back on? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's still on at the moment. How Good Is Golf is they've, they've done fifteen episodes. I've got this week on the show coming up. I've got um, with a celebrity one, which is called Getting Around. And I have got Damien Fleming. Uh, then I roll into Stephen May um, from Melbourne uh, Football Club, and I think that's it. Have I got someone else? I don't know. That's it. Time. And, yeah, because we filmed them a while ago. So, oh, yeah, the, it's all time. good and, and getting ready for next year. You can see it all on Fox Sports. Nice, nice. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for joining me today. Mate, no problem. Pleasure. Hello, how you hey, going, Russ. mate? Are you a Paracade podcast listener? I am, bro. Okay. It's a great podcast. Mm-hmm. Everyone tune in. Wait, are you Paracade. Go, Paracade. Well, welcome back, and thanks for listening to Paul Gow and his rugby league supporting story of the eels some great golfing stories in there as well it was very great to hear his golfing days with jack gibson the super coach how good was that uh and also mitch moses and clint gutherson and interesting to hear if you could put those two together you would have one awesome golfer so uh that was great to hear as well as long as the other stories as well so Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate your time in coming on the podcast and having a chat. I hope to catch up with you one day and who knows, maybe even have a a round of golf or a a couple of of holes. Who knows, you might even be able to smarten up my golfing game, that's for sure. Or come over to the Para Cave as well and we'll watch a, a Para game. Or we might even catch up at Combank Stadium for a Parramatta Eels game. But thanks again, Paul. Really appreciate it. Now, this will be available on the audios of Apple and Spotify and the any other podcast platform that you listen to. And it will be also available later on in the week as a YouTube video as well. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. So it will be broken up in two parts and... Uh, the interview will be broken up in two parts just to make it a little bit easier for you to watch if you want to do it that way and also there'll be some little short videos as well of the chat that we had with Paul so if you want to see the see the video then keep your eyes open for that one please subscribe to the YouTube channel as well it would be much appreciated a Shout out to the sponsors of the podcast. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do what I love doing. So thank you very much to major sponsor, Jack's Pale Ale, the fantastic major sponsor of the podcast. You can get your case of Jack's Pale Ale, which is available at Paramount Leagues Club in the club shop. Perfect for that Eels fan or that beer lover. Coming into summer, you got the barbecues happening, so what better way than have a Jack's Pale Ale as well? So jump into the, or drop into the club shop, get yours today, and keep an eye on the socials as well 
Follow Parramatta Leagues Club and you'll be able to see what's happening there each and every week. Bo Cook from Loan Market. His contact details are 0401 213 236. Get in contact with him for a free chat and see how and his team can help you get on top of your home loan and find you that best deal. BTZD Teamwear, the official apparel sponsor of the Paracave podcast. Head to www.btzd.com.au. Check out their range of team sportswear and see what they can do for you and let them know that you heard it here on the Paracave podcast. Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty. If you want that five-star real estate service, real estate agent service, then Shannon is your man. Contact him on 0421 488 445. And for that five-star service from Shannon from Glenmore Park Realty, looking after the Glenmore Park and the Penrith LGA areas. Please support these businesses that support the podcast that help bring you quality entertainment each and every week and share the loves on socials as well. Thank you once again to you, the listeners, for listening to the podcast each and every week. Now, if you're a new listener to the podcast, welcome. Thank you very much for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast and that way you won't miss a thing won't miss a thing as soon as the podcast drops you will get that notification and you will be able to listen to an interview with a player former player our and my tipping podcasts or my chats with the Duckman on Pulse FM each and every week. So, And also, you will be able to enjoy the back catalogue of episodes as well, some crackers in there. So for those that have already subscribed, thank you very much for your uh, listening. I uh, really appreciate the support. It means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Now, the Paracave Podcast merchandise, $10 for the Paracave Podcast hats, plus postage and handling. So if you want to order yours now, just head to the uh, Paracave Podcast socials on Facebook and Instagram or Twitter as well, and send me a message and we'll get that sorted for you ASAP. So 10 bucks. For a Paracave podcast hat, you'll see me wearing mine all the time, each and everywhere, all the time. Uh, so get yours today. Ten dollars plus postage and handling. And also, I have three polo polo shirts, Paracave podcast polo shirts available, twenty five dollars each. I got uh. Two large and one XL, I think I'll double check that one, but I'm pretty sure that's the size that I've got left. So as soon as they're gone, I will get some more for sure in sizes that you would like. Uh, but yeah, $25 each plus postage and handling. And if you want to get a combo deal, then $30 for that one plus postage and handling. So a hat and a shirt. 30 bucks what a bargain so um, those sizes left so again if you want that one then just message the podcast on any social media channel or send an email to www.theparacavepodcast at yahoo.com now what's coming up in the next week well i'll have my chats with the duck man on pulse fm 89.9 89.9 FM for those in the Sydney area and we will talk about rugby league obviously and a few other things as well what's happening in the world of rugby league at the moment the Pacific Championships and whatever else is the Cricket World Cup and whatever else is happening in the world of sport we generally chat about a few things so you can check me out on that uh, or you can catch the replay podcast as well Now, also, we'll have another interview-based style podcast next week with a former Penrith Premiership winner. So stay tuned to see who that one is. 
I can tell you it is from the first ever winning premiership team from the Penrith Panthers. So uh, who can that be? Well, you just have to stay tuned and see who that is. But thank you very much for listening to the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. Any feedback you have, it's most welcome. So please pass it on. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your support. And look, that's it for me today on the interview style podcast. And as I said, stay tuned for the YouTube uh, videos of the interview as well. So Make sure you're following all the podcasts on the social media channels to see some interesting content, see who is coming up next on both Instagram and Facebook as well, and some great and interesting guests coming your way over the next few weeks. Uh, A few more weeks of the podcast to go this year before I have a little bit of a break, and then I'll be back in 2024. So, But to sign off the show, and as I always say, the Paracave podcast, by the fan, For the fans, go para. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Paracade Podcast. See you next time.